Welcome to Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle. I'm Bobby Osinski, and this is a show all about music, music production, and the music business. My guest this week is studio designer John Stork. First of all, how many streams does it take to make both $1 and minimum wage for a month? Well, the Tricordist, which is David Lowry, checked out an indie label with a 150 album catalog that's generating about 115 million streams a month. And this is what he found. With Napster, all it takes is 53 streams to earn a dollar and 77,000, about 77,500 to earn the minimum wage, which is $1,500 a month. Tidal, you need about 80 streams for a dollar and about 118,000 for minimum wage. Apple Music, you need 136 streams to generate $1 and about 200,000 to get minimum wage. Google Play Music, you need 147 streams to generate $1 and about 218,000 streams for minimum wage. Deezer, 156 streams and about 230,000 streams for minimum wage. Spotify, this is where it gets interesting. 229 in order to generate a dollar and about 337,000 streams for minimum wage. Amazon Music, 249 to generate a dollar and 366,000 to generate minimum wage. Pandora, it drops way down. 752 in order to generate a dollar and a million 100,000 to generate minimum wage. And then we get to YouTube where it really changes. 1,449 streams to generate a dollar and 2,133,000 in order to generate minimum wage. Now let's put it into perspective though. The fact of the matter is if you have a hit, these numbers are easy to get, especially the minimum wage numbers. Even at YouTube, 2 million streams a month really isn't all that much especially if you have something that's hot. Same thing with Spotify and Amazon and even Pandora. If you have something that's hot, you can generate these numbers in no time. So the fact of the matter is, this looks a lot more daunting than it really is. The other thing is, these are just averages, and they're not even industry-wide. This is just looking at one indie label. It's not actually really huge either. So this could be way different for other labels, and it's probably different for the industry in general, kind of in the ballpark, but you get the idea of what it takes now to generate a dollar and minimum wage. If you have any questions or comments, you can send them to questions at bobbyownercircle.com. Don't forget about my online courses on mixing, production, branding, and music business success at bobbygosinskicourses.com. Also, get an expert analysis and objective opinion of your songs and mixes as a member of my Hitmakers Club. Go to hitmakersclub.com to learn more. Now, here's something I thought is very interesting. There will now be a Pulitzer Prize awarded for audio. And as they call it, for a distinguished example of audio journalism that serves the public interest, characterized by revelatory reporting and illuminating storyteller. So this isn't so much for producers of music. This is for audio journalism. But it is a step in the right direction now that we have at least some Pulitzer Prize for audio. Now, this is going to start on the 2020 cycle. So basically anything that was produced in 2019 will be eligible. So this is only for U.S. newspapers, magazines, wire services, and online news sites that publish regularly. They'll be permitted to enter audio stories in this new category, as will independent American producers and U.S. radio broadcast outlets. Just so you know what the Pulitzer Prize is, this was established by Joseph Pulitzer, who was a journalist and newspaper publisher, and he left an endowment to Columbia University upon his death in 1911. A portion founded the Columbia School of Journalism in 1912, and the rest was used to establish the Pulitzer Prizes, which were first awarded in 1917. So, for all you audio journalists out there, now is your time to earn a prestigious prize. My guest today is architect and acoustician John Stork, 
who over the course of his 50 years in the business has designed more than 3,500 audio and video production facilities, recording studios, radio stations, corporate media and conference rooms, educational and entertainment facilities, clubs, stadiums, and theaters around the world. John and his company, Walter Stork Design Group, have designed everything from private studios for Bruce Springsteen, Alicia Keys, Jay-Z, and Aerosmith, to broadcast facilities for CBS, WNET, ESPN, and the Food Network. But perhaps his most famous creation is his first, Jimi Hendrix's famous Electric Lady studio in New York City. During the interview, we spoke about designing Electric Lady, the types of studios being built today, creating the right studio vibe, the differences in studio construction over time, and much more. I spoke with John via phone from his office in New York. When you were in university, were acoustics like a primary focus for you? No, not at all. Um, I went to university from 64 to 68, 1964 to 68. And... um, I studied architecture. I entered as an architecture student. I've wanted to be an architect since I was 11. I know this for a fact. I worked every summer in an architect's office. I traveled to uh, Europe during my junior year and worked in a London office. And um, that was that was what I thought I would be doing. And in fact, still am doing, if you think about it. But also, I've been a musician since I was six. I had a clarinet player, a piano player. My parents uh, had music all the time. Uh, I got pretty good on the clarinet, the symphony band, marching band in college, and then, oh, what a surprise, rock band, which then morphed into a blues band in my last two years. And when I graduated in June of 1968, I was I was doing two things. Well, I was doing more than two things, but career-wise, I was in a blues band that was doing pretty well. We were starting to do clubs in New York. We even had an agent. And I was working during the day for an architect, not a particularly well-known one, but at least I had a job. New Young Wife, summer of 1968, Greenwich Village, New York City, time of my life. And that's how that's how July 1968 started for me. So, no acoustics, no. Okay, so how did you get the job with Jimi Hendrix then for doing his studio? Okay, well, I, I, it didn't take you long to get to that. So, uh, here's the medium length story, not the super long, but medium length. Um, in August, which is a month or two later, one night, literally, uh first wife, Geraldine, who I still stay in touch with. Um, And I went out for ice cream. There was a line at the ice cream store. Nice hot evening. And of course, in 1960, if there's a line now, you would just hit your phone. Actually, even if there isn't a line, you hit the phone. (laughs) But of course, no cell phones in 1968. And so what did you do? You sort of picked up a copy of the East Village Other or one of those local rags, and you just started thumbing through it one of those free newspapers, and I spotted an ad that said, Carpenters wanted to work for free on Experimental Nightclub. That was the ad. Got the ice cream, put a dime in the phone, rotary, called, and a half hour later, I found myself uptown meeting two very strange guys who had this idea to build a kind of sensorium in a loft in Soho, which everybody barely knew where that was, that people would come in and put gowns on and it would be sort of theater and a club. You would spend three hours there and sometimes it would look like Africa and then the lights would change and it could look like New England and the music would change and it's all done with projectors and changing lights. And it all seemed quite interesting and you would enter through a kind of a passageway onto these floating areas that were raised above the floor where the fog could get up. And I, and I sort of, I, I kind of got attracted to the idea. The whole thing seemed kind of interesting. So I said, okay, I'll, I'll work at night and help you build this. This seemed like fun. Only if you let me redesign the club. And they said, yes, all in the same evening. So I found myself redesigning this club, building it. It opened in November, 
by February was on the cover of Life magazine and became one of the three or four things you did when you were in New York in the experimental theater downtown art world. And anybody who was anybody would go there, would end up going there for the nine months that it stayed open. It closed in August of that summer. It actually closed right after Woodstock, August 1969. One night, Jimi Hendrix went there because it was the thing to do. He, at the time, was contemplating with his manager purchasing the generation. The generation was in the basement of the 8th Street Film Guild film building, and that was a very well-known blues club, maybe the most well-known down in the village on 8th Street. By the way, that same club is a club that I used to go to one and two years earlier when I was in the blues band at Princeton right down the road about an hour because that's where you went if you wanted to hear James Cotton and Buddy Guy, Junior Wells, etc. You would go to the generation. So I felt, well, this is kind of a coincidence. And literally, Jimmy, actually his manager, called me. I got a call from his manager. Do you want to do design a club for Jimmy? Jimmy said, fine. Who did this Cerebrum? Cerebrum was the name of the club. And, and get that guy to do my club. He was going to take over the lease on this club. So now I'm 22 years old, getting a call from Jimi Hendrix to do a club. Mind you, still in the band and still working during the day. And that is exactly what I did. I went to the meeting. I got hired. It was all quite interesting for me. And over the next few weeks at night, I designed and drew the drawings for a club. Went for the presentation. The, the club was... Uh, accepted and um, but at the last minute and now comes the moment you're waiting for his ma his producer engineer Eddie Kramer the name that I'm sure you know oh yeah um, convinced Jimmy and Jimmy's manager to not build the club now this club had an interesting idea it had a small little control room in the back where they would record everything that was going on on the stage now, mind you, none of this seemed unusual or non-unusual to me because I had no, I'm 22 years old, so I don't even, I have no idea whether this is normal or not. I, I must say that nobody really knew how they would record everybody. Recording was still in its infancy. I'm not sure if a lot of clubs had recording control rooms in them. Probably not. And so Eddie Kramer convinces Jimmy to not build the club, but to build a recording studio, reminding Jimmy and his manager, Michael Jeffrey, that Jimmy's running up three, four $400,000 a year recording bills. That's a lot in 1968. And that's a lot now, actually. And so the club is scrapped. I want to strangle Eddie Kramer. I can remember the meeting like it was yesterday because my first kind of cool commission comes and goes in about one millisecond. At which point they literally in the same meeting turned to me and said, you can stay on and do the studio. <laughs> I reminded them that I had actually never been in a studio and I really didn't know very much about studios. And they said, that's okay. We want you to do the studio, try to figure out how to do it. And that's, that's the moment where my studio design career started right at that moment. I wanted to strangle Eddie, then I wanted to hug him. Eddie has remained, of course, a lifetime friend. He's my daughter's godfather. I see him all the time. I just saw him this week, of course, at AES. And we stay in touch, and we've done a number of projects together. So I quit my architecture job. I created my own internship. We basically found an acoustician who knew a lot about isolation, and I agreed to do all the drawings for this project, as well as his other projects for free, if I could hang out in his office. Okay, I, of course, read passionately. I enrolled in two courses at Columbia, one with Cyril Harris, the, the Symphony Hall acoustician, and tried to learn as much as I could quickly. And over the next 15 months, uh, by the seat of our pants, got Electric Lady built. Uh, some of it was intuition. Some of it was actually hard, researched uh, calculations. Uh, quite a bit was luck. Uh, it would take 25 years before I truly understood why live, the Studio A, which has basically been unchanged for 50 years, uh, works. It, it always worked from day one. And finally, after 25 years, I was able to measure the room acoustically and 
and determine why it works so well. It has to do with the sealing and the fact that it's a membrane absorber. But somehow this got done, and it opened a year and so so later in that following August of, of 70. And, of course, Jimmy didn't get to spend very much time in it. But before it was built, I had three other studios to build. Um, career tip, make your first project famous, I guess. That's <laughs> all I can conclude from that. And... Um, it changed my life. Other things were happening at the same time. Because of Cerebrum, I got chosen to study with Bucky Fuller in an exclusive 20-person group called the World Game down the road at the, at the Art League. And uh, other opportunities opened for me. Uh, life just changed on a dime. Uh, these were exciting times. And I basically never went back to my architecture job. This is the only time I ever worked for anyone. And by the time it was open, I... I guess I had a career in studio design in an era when there really wasn't a studio design universe. Um, even now, it's a relatively small universe compared to other universes, but it just didn't exist. Jimmy's little did I know that I was creating one of the first project studios, uh, certainly creating the first studio below 42nd Street um, or below 34th Street. And But again, Bobby, you have to understand that none of this seemed unusual to me because I had no perspective. I, I, the word project studio didn't even exist, but that is, in fact, what we were making. We, we created an artist studio. It never really was designed to run as a commercial studio, although when Jimmy died, his manager then ran it as a commercial studio. And, of course, as if somebody was watching from above, Jimmy leaves us, and who moves in for a year but Stevie Wonder? One genius left and another genius moved in for a year. And that also changed my life because I got to hang out with him and I got to, of course, spend a lot of time with Bob Margoloff and Malcolm Cecil, who were the geniuses behind all that synthesizer work, Bobby becoming a lifetime friend. And then when Stevie moved to California, I followed and did his studio at the record plant. So that's, that's the beginning seed of how it started. One more little moment, as long as I can bend your ear. Sure. That Generation Blues Club, which, which became Electric Lady in the basement of the film guild, was the same film guild that I had known about from photos all through college. That building and the film guild was designed by an obscure Viennese architect by the name of Frederick Kiesler, who I was a huge fan of. Frederick Kiesler came to New York in the 20s got this commission, designed this film theater, which was, by the way, the first theater uh, in the United States not to have a stage. The early film theaters were vaudeville theaters. And then basically didn't really design another building for the rest of his life until the early 60s when he designed the Museum for the Dead Sea Scrolls in Israel, which was a building that I did know about and I had been to. But I knew about this film building because, of, because from pictures, but I didn't know where it was. Even when I was at the generation, I, I had no idea. I was in the basement of that building. And it wasn't until I went to file the drawings at the building department, which I did in person, that the original blue, literally blueprints, that they had on file were rolled out, and there was Frederick Kiesler's name. I, I, I can remember that moment literally like it was yesterday. I mean, here I was that I had spent all this time, and now I'm actually renovating a building designed by one of my three idols in, in college. The other two were architects that you probably have heard of, Antonio Gaudi, the Barcelonian architect, and, and Frank Lloyd Wright. These were my favorite architects. But Frederick Kiesler was also one kind of unknown. So the full serendipity bug had stricken me big time. It is my favorite word. I believe in it. I have never doubted it for one moment. Uh, always walk around with your antennas up. Never know what you're going to receive. Well, it happens to everybody, but I don't think on that level. <laughs> That's pretty fantastic because it happened on so many levels to you. It did, and I'm and I'm thankful for it. I just, you know, this last week at the AES, we, my marketing PR people. I mean, now I have a 50 person company in five offices and things of change. I, the W of WSDG is Walters. That's my wife, Beth Walters. And of course, for 32 years, we've been partners in everything. 
and life changed for me big time when I met her. And um, I'm so we took this week to celebrate 50 years, and we had a lot of some big dinner and a lot of photo ops, interviews, and and whatnot. And and then I basically told my team, I said, I don't mind doing this for a week, and it's fun, and I want to say thank you, and we get our share of awards and commissions. And then I kind of decompressed for the weekend. And then I told everyone, I said, I'm going back to work on Monday. So I, I'm working today. And I was up at five. I love my work. I'm not interested in retiring. Um, I've made some shifts in my career. Some of the ownership has now been given to my younger associates who are now partners. So our company is going to continue after I'm not here. And, um, but I draw every day. I, I, I missed your first phone call because I was in another room on a sketch. <laughs> Sketching yeah. something today. So I still like what I'm doing. I, I, I enjoy very much what I'm doing. I still think there's room for growth. There's room for, uh, for continuing this, this exploration, which is really, I mean, what Jimmy allowed me to do was take my two favorite loves and, and combine them with another love that I didn't realize I love, which is technology. I, I've always kind of been fond of technology. I guess that was the carpenter in me. And I'm not a mixing engineer. I'm not an audio engineer, but I love tech. I love engineering. I love structures. And so architecture, acoustics, and systems integration, that's what we do. And I, we're at the nexus of those three disciplines. We don't, I don't think one gets painted on another. I don't think one gets added to another. I think it's a three-person dance that we pretty much do all the time. I can be looking at a drawing and I can be looking at a door swing and 10 seconds later, a speaker angle. And one minute later, how's the air conditioning going to drop in through the ceiling cloud? And I find that not even unusual. I find that to be just what we do. I yeah. enjoy doing it. So yeah. Yeah. I'm very, you know, me, Jimmy, Jimmy's legacy for me is the studio. I mean, I'm obviously we, we love his music and, but I am in, incredibly thankful for for that moment. Um, you're right. I guess in retrospect, it did happen in a slightly bigger way than happens to other people. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would say. How about when you look back now at Electric Lady, do you think, well, I wish I did that differently or I could have done that better? Oh, I could say that about almost every project I've done and it's over 3,000. Yes, I'm con it's it's a little bit of a of a problem with our work because think about what we're doing or what I'm doing. I'm programming, sketching, designing, dealing with clients, creating construction drawings, going through the intense process of getting something built. And by the time something opens, it could be a year, it could be two years later. A fast project is six months. And you've already moved on. It's not like you can write a song and then, okay, let's write another song. Or let's paint a stroke on a canvas and then the next day you can paint over it. These are real studios. These are real projects that get built with real budgets and real building codes and real clients and real financial conversations, et cetera, et cetera, and real dreams. Often not my dream. In fact, usually not my dream. So there's never a project that when we find, that when it, I mean, within a second of walking through it, it's like, oh, man, I wish I would have lowered that, or this should have been higher, or the window is the wrong shape. or I, I mean, I, it's, it's a little bit of an end. It's a problem. But we get used to it, and, and we just, you know, we're yeah. happy that we got an opportunity to explore. And so, yeah, of course, Electric Lady, I wish there were a number of things I did differently. Um, the control room was one of them. The good news is it got renovated three times over the last 50 years. Um, and um, I was just involved in retuning the current control room, so that was fun. Um, the, but the live room, which is, of course, the iconic room, the room that everyone knows. And, I, you know, Electric Lady is really a tracking studio. It's got a number of other smaller rooms in the upper parts of the building, but the iconic studio is the tracking studio with that ceiling. And that basically unchanged. Basically it's never changed. Hmm. Um, there's some cosmetics and 
They took a mural from the lobby and moved it into the studio, which actually I think looks better. Um, it was a mural that Jimmy had commissioned because uh, the lobby changed uh, several times. Um, but it's, you know, you still enter through a tiny little door and you walk down the same stair that you always walk down. Nothing's so we got lucky on that. But Bobby, I'm I'm constantly seeing things I wish I would have done different. John, here's a big picture question for you, and it's something that I'm really curious about. Given the status of commercial studios these days, I know that you're busy and there's a lot of other studio developers like you that are busy as well. Who's building these studios? Who are your clients? Well, okay, that's, you know, I, I understand where you're going with this question. The fact is, is there's, there's a, we, we, we have a tremendous amount of work. We have 50 people worldwide and we're, we're slammed. I mean, I have a shortage of people right now, not work. Um, we turn down work from time to time. We're very thankful that our clients call us, but uh, sometimes we, with something not right or it's below our radar. So who's building these? Well, the better question is who's not building them. <laughs> Let's go to that question first, if, if I can. Sure. What's not really being built is what many people think studios are or were, including possibly you or me, like a record plant, like a hit factory, like a criteria. These big, what Chris Stone labeled a long time ago, God bless Chris, you remember Chris? Sure, Chris, sure. From the record plant, and Chris did it, did it what I consider to be the, 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 the mother load of articles on the studio world where he described studios as being, you know, motherships and satellites. So the big mothership studios are not being built that much anymore. That doesn't mean that big studios aren't being built anymore. But what's not being built anymore are studios that work on what I would call the limousine business model, basically renting out his time, like an electric lady. Okay, those days are 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 ending. Uh, I mean, on on a certain level, they're they're over. There, there's no reason to have a lot of those studios anymore. Real estate's too expensive. Um, it's not a particularly good business, even though equipment got cheaper, much cheaper. So we have them few and far between. There's always going to be a need for some very big rooms, orchestral size even, big tracking rooms like a lady, okay, or an avatar, a capital in L.A., Abbey Road. And, and there are certainly going to remain iconic studios that just be, because of their sheer legacy are, are not going to stop. But that's not really what's being built. Now what's being built are a wide variety of other CCCs, content capture centers, what you and I would call recording studios, but it's more than just recording. So who's building them? Every third church has a recording studio. Every radio station has a recording studio. Every artist almost has a recording studio, okay? Yeah. Podcast studios can't keep up with them fast enough. Advertising agencies, corporate headquarters, and the list goes on and on, all want recording studios. Of course, schools all want them, not only to teach recording, but to actually, but to also use them for recording things. Okay? I, we put recording studios in sports complexes. Okay? So you start adding up all these different, and then there are people who are building what I call vanity studios or hobby studios. They they want a studio like someone else wants a Maserati. They don't really care about driving, but they care about playing their guitar. Okay? So you start adding up all these wide variety of uses. And when was this possible? You know the answer. Think about it. The minute digital came into the recording chain was the first moment when you knew that equipment would be one-tenth the price that it was in 1969. Okay. Yeah. You can have a recording studio for fifty thousand dollars worth of equipment. I can have a damn recording studio with my iPhone if I want to accept certain limitations. So the minute the equipment became very small, doesn't require a lot of power, you can buy it on Amazon, and you can. Okay. Um, then it became democratized. What does that mean? Everybody can have it. So the minute everybody could get it easily, that meant everybody could could enjoy having a quote. CCC, Content Capture Center, or Recording Studio. So now what distinguishes one studio from another? It's no longer the equipment. It's all great equipment. I mean, go to the shows. They're shrinking. 
Why? Because it's fungible. It's almost commoditized. So the only thing now that distinguishes studios are great acoustics and vibe. Strangely enough, the two things that I've been passionately interested in for 50 years, okay? And that's all I've ever been interested in. I love the equipment, and I have to understand the equipment. And there is some incredible equipment out there, particularly speakers, okay? Yeah. But the nexus of architecture, okay, and acoustics, and architecture basically is solving real-scale ergonomics, matrix with vibe and feeling and passion, this is what I, what I and people who have kind of become my partners in crime have always been interested in. And that is, what, that is now the only thing that distinguishes one studio from another. They all have great equipment. So there are tons of studios being built. They just come in different forms. And we were very lucky, again, another stroke of luck, because I realized that this was going to happen relatively early. Okay, and so while we were waking up every day seeing the headlines for big studios closing, Sony closes, record plan closes, and, you know, they make those kinds of headlines. Everybody likes bad news. You know that. Nobody really wants to hear good news. They just want to hear bad news. So while there were some, quote, catastrophic headlines, which could trick you into thinking that the recording studio world was collapsing, that, in fact, it wasn't collapsing at all. It was just being, it was just being changed. And the change was always in the cards. It was always going to happen. Okay? Same with the – and you could have this podcast and talk about the distribution and how records are made in the music business, and I'm sure you have. Okay? And – but at the end of the day, all this music that's being made, and there's ten times more music and content than there ever was, got to be made somewhere, Bobby. It doesn't come falling out of the sky. Yeah. <laughs> Believe right. me. Got to be made somewhere. So me, I don't really care if Netflix has 10 recording studios or Spotify has 10 recording studios or Sony wants to build new recording studios or, or, or whoever, or Pepsi wants to have their own studio or, or who, it doesn't make any difference to me. I, I just want, I just want the opportunity to create the environments because that was what has always been interesting to me. Sure. And we'll let the business guys figure it out. We'll let, we'll let the distribution people figure out how the music's supposed to be distributed and whether it's supposed to be streamed. We'll let somebody else get into the digital versus analog debate, which I've always found a little bit silly. Okay. And that's okay. Other people can fight those battles. I just want to make the environments. Okay. But you mentioned something before about vibe and you've been in them and certainly I've been in them where there are some studios that the vibe is just wrong right away. Yeah, I mean, you feel it. You walk in and you go, well, okay, uh, I don't know if I can work here. Yeah. So what is it that defines vibe for you? Well, two or three ways of looking at that. So sometimes we're on projects where our job is that of being a shepherd. In other words, our job is to capture what we think our client wants the studio to be and feel like, by the way, going all the way back to Jimmy and then execute. So in that case, we're not in charge of the vibe. We're in charge of executing the vibe and making sure it's integrated correctly with acoustics and architecture. It was really funny. About five years ago, we got to do a studio for, for Paul Epworth, uh, who, of course, you know, the Dell's producer. And Paul had worked at Jungle in the city in New York for a while and had gotten very fond of of that control room and that sound, and that's based on, it's an Augsburger system, Augsburger type system. It's a horn loaded system. Mm -hmm. And recognized that there really was no system like that in London. It's just not very common. There's now a few of them. He was in the process of buying the church, the studio that the Eurythmics owned. And he did buy the church. And there was a room there that he wanted to convert to similar acoustics and similar uh, setup as J uh, Jungle Studio Control Room A. Ironically, the size of the room was almost identical. It, it, we, it would not be hard for us to lay it in. We'd have to gut the place, but we could lay it in. And so we took the job. He, he called us, we took the job, we met. So of course, I well, the conversation led very quickly to what you and I are calling vibe on this call right now. So, you know, Paul, what do you, 
how you feel about this? What do you want this to be? Because it was mostly for him, but he also wanted to set it up so that it could be rented out to other people. And then he turns to me and says, you know, and this is a you know, British accent that I am not particularly good at imitating. Very sweet guy, Paul. A very nice man. And, and very, he's a producer, so he's very focused. Knows how to talk to artists. And, and um, he turns to me and says, you know, John, I was thinking that maybe everything is white. And we just change it by changing the lights. <laughs> so I said to myself, I haven't come very far in 45 years because that's exactly what Jimmy said to me. I want everything white and then we'll just change it with the colors. Of course, now you could do it. You can go to Home Depot and, and get the equipment to do that. It's, it's pretty easy right now. Um, you could just put different bulbs in and do it. Um, we ended up, ended up getting a, a more advanced system, but conceptually exactly the same. And we did it with cove lighting and ceiling lighting. We had a clear diffuser in the back with lights behind it. And so his studio can be anything he wants. So that was his solution to Vibe. Okay. Other times people allow us to pick it up. So then it's our job to maybe just dream based on a small conversation with, with a client. We may pick up something that we want to focus on. There have been some geometries, particularly in the ceilings. A lot of people recognize our work by the intricate ceilings because I'm, I don't know, for some reason I've always been fond of, of making the ceilings very, very interesting. And so we, we're always exploring certain geometries there and we're exploring certain lighting. So it really depends on whether we're dreaming on our own or whether we're basically being guides to some, someone else's dream. Your, your question about whether a vibe is right, I don't, no disrespect to your question, it's, it's sort of like saying, why didn't you like this novel? I mean, you know, you either like the novel or you don't like the novel. Yeah, it's an individual. And, and that's, I guess, since my work started with somebody who was not designing a studio for everyone. As a matter of fact, just the opposite. The studio was being designed for one person. So right off the bat, it, I always assumed that on a project, there is a signature of some sort. Sometimes it's ours. For instance, for schools, where they have to be a lot of things to a lot of people, or corporations that want studios where there is no single person. As a matter of fact, they, it's, all, it's just the opposite. They, they, they'll come to us and they'll say, well, you put a signature on it. You put a spin on it. And then we try to do our best. We have people here that are better at it than others. I am not particularly, I don't think in terms of color as much as my wife does. She, as a matter of fact, we're, we're, we, we just started a project. Um, we're going to take three or four studios from each year for 50 years, which we think we have all the photographs. And we're going to put it in a line, be about 10 feet long. Hmm. And we're, I'm pretty sure you'll see a change You'll see more color starting 32 years ago because that's when Beth entered my life. She's a textile designer. She was a uh, installation uh, chief at Fashion Institute of Technology. So she's she's not an acquisition. She's not an architect by training, but very color oriented. I'm not. I'm not. I see things mostly in black and white. Didn't pay too much attention to color in those first 10 and 15 years of my studio design, it, it worked well for me because the Langua Franca of studios, as we, as we entered that great age of everybody building a studio in the 70s um, with way too much money, it seemed that the Langua Franca was wood. Everybody just felt that wood would be, would be correct. There's no real acoustic understanding. I mean, there's no acoustic science to that sense, but everybody, oh, if you got wood, it's going to be good. So, of course, that was very easy for me because I didn't have to think too much about color. I just had to think about species and stain. So, um, but then that's changed. We, we now are in an era where any material can be used and is used in studio construction. There's really no limit anymore. I have absorptive glass and reflective curtains. I mean, you can get anything to almost behave anyway. Well, let's talk about that for a second, John. What do you see as materials that have been a game changer? Acoustically, I, I think the materials haven't changed. I think what changed the game changer was everybody understanding that every material is an acoustic material. Uh, when I basically 
as I entered this field, there were only two or three things you could play with. You could put fuzzy stuff, some, some basically velocity absorbers, carpet, insulation, fabric wrap panels, curtains, that kind of stuff on surfaces, and that would absorb sound, but it would not but it would only be efficient at mids and high frequencies because velocity absorbers don't do very well at low frequencies because wavelengths are really big. Now, you could override that by leaving a lot of air. So if you took your curtain, if you took your foam and you put it up against the wall, it would absorb 1,000 hertz but would do nothing at 60 hertz. On the other hand, if you put a, if you put a foot airspace between the foam and the wall, then it would, do, it would become more efficient at low frequency. That, what, what I just described is essentially the science, and I use the word science in quotes, behind what for years everybody called bass traps, mm, right. which were basically large, built-out volumes in rooms. And, and you've seen this in a lot of older studios, and I used it an awful lot because we understood that if you left a lot of air or you put hanging baffles in soffit fascia constructions around rooms or in corners, you could get low frequency absorption, which would help to even out the reverb time response and thus even out the frequency response in the room. And there was some voodoo associated with it. There was a little bit of science, nothing like we have now. When did everything change? For me, everything changed when Heiser's time delay spectrometry was finally introduced as something that was semi-practical. Don Davis and his team were really the first guys to sort of get this thing into a form that you could use it. Uh, I remember. I was honored to see it early. We were the, I was, me and, my, me and two friends, we were the first guys to bring Don Davis into a studio. He had never been in a recording studio. He did all of his work in churches. And we brought him into Bearsville one night to make some measurements. Of course, that led to other people, including myself, finally realizing that we had absorption and diffusion in the wrong places in the control room. But what it really opened the door for was for the first time, and it took about 10 or 15 years, we could now really measure what was going on in the room rather than guess. And then, of course, the other big breakthrough, once we understood how to get impulse responses and how valuable they were, then several people figured out how to get the impulse responses from drawings. And that opened up the era of oralization. By that, I mean being able to listen to rooms from drawings. These few really important acoustic events certainly changed my life and then I think opened the door for lots of people recognizing that every material could be is an acoustic material and could be used in environments if you understood how to use it. So if I needed a big window somewhere, why would you need a window? Because you want to look through it. I mean that's that's what windows do. But I needed that surface to be absorptive. I could make that happen by microperfing it. I could put a piece of plastic in front of it and have little microperfs. If I needed to absorb 45 hertz in a room because there was a modal buildup, either due to the room mode calculation or speaker boundary interference because of the speaker placement, I could create a thin 45 hertz absorber by making a membrane absorber which we now know how to do and could predict. So I, I'm, this can't be an acoustics course. It's, we don't have enough time. Yeah. But I'm teasing you with, what, with the kind of tools that we now have. And th this is really exciting to me. So we no longer, we're definitely not in the era where all you can do is put some curtains up or some foam. Um, we're now in an era where you could almost have any material anywhere in your dreams and then back into an acoustic solution by having that material do certain things for you. I can have an entire wall look like it's wood and be made out of wood, but it could be absorptive. Um, on the other hand, I could, I could have fabric on a wall, but have it be reflective because I could make it so porous that sound would go through it. And these are two very extreme examples. So these are exciting times. So once again, uh, Vibe is everything. Vibe meaning aesthetics. Change the word vibe to aesthetics. Yeah, yeah. I think it gets a little bit more interesting. Okay, here's a question for you. Back in the 80s, it seemed like there were dedicated contractors. If you wanted to build a studio, there were lots of people 
that you could design it and then there were teams that you can call that were good at it and putting it together and executing those plans. Yeah. And, and that's not the case anymore. So how do you do that? How do you have quality control with your contractors? Especially like out of the country. Well, okay. Okay. So a few parts to that question. First of all, there are builders who are in fact studio builders and are better at it. Um, on the other hand, they don't exist everywhere. So in, in, the, in environments where you would expect there to be a small universe of studio builders, I mean, like in New York City, there's two or three guys that do most of the studios. In L.A., same thing. Nashville, same thing. You would expect these kinds of cities to have that universe of experienced studio builders. Now, what is a studio builder? A studio builder is a builder who built 10 studios. And, of course, the first time he built the studio, he wasn't the studio builder. He just got good at it. He's sensitive to details. He knows where to source materials. He understands the sequence of how things should be built, which is not always specified on drawings. Most, most designs don't go into means and methods. Means and methods are usually left up to builders. Designers essentially draw final designs. So we try to use them in the, in the areas where we can identify them. Now, part B of your question is, what about when you're not in one of those areas? Like you're putting a studio for the first time in Guangzhou, China, where there's no studio builder. They, nobody's ever built a world-class studio there. And, of course, we did do that, okay? Or the first studio in Bogota, Colombia, or the first studio in Iceland. And so there we don't have studio builders, or you're on a – job in a major urban environment where you can't use your studio builders. Most, quote, studio builders are non-union. Sometimes you're in a union environment, like in New York, and you're simply not allowed to use them. In that case, the clue, Bobby, is drawings. Again, was never uncomfortable for us. I'm an architecture student. I am a licensed architect. I mean, not only did I study architecture, but I finally got my license, and we had a few people with licenses. So we draw. A lot of there are a number of studio designers that don't really draw. I mean, they draw and they sketch, but they don't go the full, they don't go the full distance and create construction documents. So we draw, we do not take projects where people don't want us to draw. In other words, if, if they're not prepared to sign on to that amount of work, which translates into a certain fee, we just don't want to do it. I don't want that responsibility. We go to, I mean, right now, I'm open. Actually, as I'm talking to you, I'm opening my sheet. I have about, like right now in our New York office, we have 50, 50 projects. Actually, let me tell you how many projects we have. We, just, we have our meetings every Monday morning. We didn't have one last Monday. We have 57 projects. Okay. Now, what, where are these projects? 16 of them are in construction. So that means projects are being built. They're in construction right now. 18 are what I would call consulting projects. So these are projects where maybe we have to test something or somebody wants us to do a site survey, et cetera, et cetera. So they're not yet resulting in build. They're just resulting in reports and analysis. We're selling intelligence. And then we have 23 projects that are in drawing. We're drawing them. We're either in schematic or design development or sketching or hard CDs, construction documents. So the ones that are being built, okay, the, the 16 that are being built, and they're all over the world, San Francisco, China, New Jersey, uh, North Dakota, New York City, Interlochen, Michigan, Rhinebeck, New York, Houston. Uh, I'm literally reading off of a column L in my sheet here. How are we navigating those? About a third of them are being built by builders that we know, or we're one degree of separation from them. We know who they are, and we trust them. And the other ones, they're new builders, and we get reports every week. We attend virtual meetings. We're in a kind of a cool era, because we can be in project meetings without having to go there. And, and we fly over to the sites. Somebody, at least one person, is out of our office every week. Uh, we have a very nice radio station that we're involved with about an hour from here. Every Friday morning, one of our guys goes directly there. They're paying for it. They want that supervision, and we're there every Friday. 
Um, huge project being built now in LA, not at liberty to discuss who this is for, but it's quite substantial, multiple studios. And um, there's two meetings a week, which we attend virtually. And once every three weeks, we put somebody on the ground. So heavy supervision and heavy drawings is how we solve that. Got it. We also, in the beginning of every job, if it's a builder we don't know, we actually give a little course. We've prepared a kind of a construction tutorial, if you might add, if you might, if I could, if I could call it that. It's literally a class in construction details and things you're going to be on the lookout for. And we will present that, you know, sometime in person or sometimes on a webinar. Um, I use it in my course. I teach studio design. I want, not very many schools have full courses in this. Berkeley does in Boston. And I teach that in the spring, 16-hour course. So imagine 16 hours of that last question that we did for four minutes. Yeah, no, that'd be great. I'd like to take that myself, to be honest with you. You would enjoy it. I'm sure. Last question, John, and thank you so much for your time. I appreciate it. I know you're, how busy you are. Well, it's an honor. I'm pretty familiar with your your work, and you, you've always been very astute in your writing and your observations. I you know, think the industry is is lucky to have you digging in on some of these issues. So thank, thanks to you, actually. Thank you very much. What's the best piece of business advice that maybe somebody imparted to you or maybe you learned along the way? Well, a few. I already gave you one. Make your first project famous. That would help. <laughs> <laughs> but I got a few. I mean, everything I learned that, I, okay, first of all, I'm not, you know, I didn't grow up as a business guy. I, I couldn't read a balance sheet till I was 40. I'm, I'm 73 now. I, I try to act 53, but I'm 73. And I, I literally could not read a balance sheet. Um, when Beth and I finally united forces to form WSDG, which is what the industry knows us as, after about a year, I mean, we had about four or five people working for us uh, with no satellite firms around the world. That's all. All of that is, is organic. I tell you this story because I will lead up to it a piece of advice. Beth, Beth, who's also not a business person, she's a, she's a fashion textile designer. We looked at each other one night and said, we, maybe we should get some help. You know, maybe we could hire someone who could sort of help us a little bit with the business. <laughs> like, what are we doing here? You know, I mean, we're sending out bills and doing the work, but we're not, we don't really know what we're doing. So who did we hire? We hired Chris Stone. Chris Stone had retired from Rector Plant, or, or he sold it, I don't know, if, I'm losing track, and he had opened up, he had his own sort of little consulting business. And I had worked with Chris because Chris hired me to do Studio B for Stevie. And, and we hired Chris. He came and he visited us for a week, charged us three or four grand, which seemed like a lot of money then. And he gave us a report. He told us things to do that, Bobby, we still do today. He said, you have to have a weekly office meeting. You need an employer handbook. Even if there's only three employers, you have to have some rules, and guidelines. You have to switch from cash accounting to accrual accounting. I, I, never, I never even heard of the word accrual. I, I had no idea what that meant. I learned. It took two years, but I learned, and it was painful, but we did it. And so there's the first piece of advice. If you think you want to be in business, learn accrual accounting. Cash accounting is, is worthless. It's, it's meaningless. It, it just tells you how much cash you have. You can't manage with it. There's no way you can make decisions. It doesn't tell you what's going on. It just tells you how much money you have. Might as well just go to the bank. And they'll tell you how much money you have. So this this was a huge piece of advice, along with some an organizational diagram. I said, Chris, I only got four people. He said, it doesn't mean you can't have a diagram. It just means that the boxes are all filled with the same names. But you need a diagram. So... Year after year, whenever we would see Chris, now fast forward 15 years, 20 years, we've gotten bigger. Uh, students became interns. Interns became returned to their mother countries. We formed satellite offices. They've become partners. Uh, life has gotten a little bit more complicated. I would always see Chris, and I'd say, Chris, we still use some of those ideas you told us. And Chris would turn to me and say, can I send you another invoice? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if you ever... I don't know if you ever had the pleasure of meeting Chris. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. One of a kind. 
Yeah, a one of a kind. Yeah, truly. And he would say, "Can I send you another invoice?" And we would just laugh. Yeah. <laughs> it was so funny, and of course, very very sad when he left us not that long ago. Yeah, long overdue award at, at Tech at the NAM too. So, yeah, okay. So there's a business advice: I trust your instincts. Don't not finish. You know, fasten your seatbelt. You're going to have things that go backwards. I'm in this for 50 years. You you can't not have things that didn't, you, you will meet some failure. Things are not always going to work, but, you, but don't quit. You got to, you got to finish. And we always finish. I never not finish. You know, I learned this from my dad. Take some time and pay attention to your family. Some of this stuff is obvious. Well, I mean, it's just, as far as a business is, is, is concerned, our business, and I say our because it's Beth and my and now other partners, has really moved forward very organically. Because I, I went to a liberal arts school. I'm a huge, I have four kids. I made sure they all went to liberal arts colleges. And one of them's in construction. One of them sells bonds. Very successful, by the way. My youngest daughter is in the medical world. She does involved in medical testing. She was a science major. And the fourth one is in marketing. They all went to liberal arts schools because anybody can learn Pro Tools. What is hard to learn is how to cry. Very hard to learn how to cry. Very hard to learn how to say no. And I could go on and on. I don't want to wax prolific here. Where do you learn that? You don't learn it at a technical school. You don't learn it in the Pro Tools manual. Well, you might learn it by watching Netflix if you paid attention. Okay. <laughs> yeah, right. You, you learn it by absorbing great literature and, and the arts. So I've always been a believer in arts. So even more to the point of a perfect intersection and nexus of all the things that mean a lot to me. The only two I've left out besides the obvious family and lovemaking stuff is, of course, I'm a big baseball fan and I'm a scuba diving guy. So I'm not a lot of studios underwater and – I have put a studio in a major league baseball stadium, but other than that, I still play ball. Which one? We put a studio in Baltimore. Okay. We did a, a small studio. Yeah, I'm a baseball fan too, so yeah, I'm always curious about that. Happy uh, 50th anniversary. Congratulations. Thank you. It just means, yeah, it means I started young and didn't die, <laughs> but you still got to stick it out for the 50 years, and the thanks really goes to my team. I got some really great partners. As I said, my, my partners are essentially students who became interns who then went on to be partners. And now they're my teachers. That's the other thing. Learn to learn because, and you know this, you, you know, you're, you always got to keep learning. Even on a little conversation like this, I mean, it looks and feels like it was one way you're asking and I'm giving, but even in an hour, I'm taking away something. One of your questions gets me to think about something, you know, I mean, it's been a while since I thought about what would I do different at Electric Lady. I'm constantly asked, what would you do different? What, where, you know, name your 10 mistakes. And I'm, I, you know, let's see, what would I have done different at Electric Lady? I don't know. I'm going to think about that after I get off the phone. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for the question. You can find out more about John at WSDG.com. WSDG.com. Thanks for listening and being in my inner circle. Remember, if you have any questions or comments, send them to questions at bobbyoinnercircle.com. To listen to other episodes of Bobby Osinski's Inner Circle, go to bobbyosinski.com and select the podcast tab, or go to bobbyoinnercircle.com, where you can find it on iTunes, Stitcher, Mixcloud, Google Play, Google Podcasts, Spotify, Deezer, TuneIn Radio, Radio Public, and Podbean. At bobbyosinski.com and bobbyoinnercircle.com, You'll also find a sign-up form for my newsletter and for alerts for new podcasts. This is Bobby Osinski. I will see you next time.